Right, hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Ruben Castillo. I'm an adjunct faculty member here at the Community College, as well as um, the Kansas City Art Institute Printmaking Department. And it brings me great pleasure to introduce you our next speaker, someone I've had the pleasure of knowing personally for 10 years. Um, I first met Matthew while we were both studying printmaking at KCAI, working long and late hours in various projects, sitting through grueling critiques and crying, lots and lots and lots of crying. <laughs> Um, over this decade that we've known each other, um, I've seen such a remarkable transformation in his work and ideas. Um, it is now such an honor to be introducing you all to what I've known since first meeting him. Um, Matthew is a charming, brilliant, tenaciously dedicated artist in the studio, dedicated to his uh, craft um, and to his ideas, and a maker of remarkably sensitive, humorous, and beautiful narratives. Matthew Willie Garcia was born and raised in Tulare, Cal uh, California. He received a BFA in printmaking from the Kansas City Art Institute and uh, currently is an MFA candidate at the University of Kansas. Matthew lives and works between Kansas City, Missouri and Lawrence, uh, Kansas. He is, uh, he is known as a queer inter interdimensional explorer. Ugh, I tried to get that one out. And often finds himself thinking about, among, other th among many things, but Lisa Frank. Star Trek, Voyager, RuPaul's Drag Race, and the curvature of space-time. I'm thrilled for the journey you are all about to go on. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to my friend Matthew. Hello. Uh, thank you, Ruben, um, for that really, really kind introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I want to start by thanking the Nerman and the Des Moines Art Center for putting the show on. It's it's a privilege to be part of this show. It's a it's amazing that this show gets to happen in Kansas City, um, and that so many different people are represented in this space. And it's a space that we didn't have to fight for. That we got we got it given to us freely. And so I mean, we did. There was a lot of fighting that came with getting to this point, but at this point, it was not something that we had to subvert and sneak in. It's something that we got to do, and especially as abstract artists, to be represented um, in this space is amazing. Um, I also want to thank Bruce Hartman and Jared Ledesma for inviting me to be part of the show. I feel honored and very grateful. Um, Arthur Miller and Andrew Scheel for helping me with the install. It was grueling, and it took a lot longer than I expected, and um, everyone else who made this um, afternoon and this evening and the show happen. Um, before I start talking about the work, I just want to read this poem um, to set the tone of the work. Um, it's one of my poems that I've written recently. Um, Quantumly entangled, when defining space, we calculate the infinite expanse, the void, the curvature of space and time, and in a distant, and the distance between Arius and Aquarius is like the distance between the earth and the sun. But in the quantum realm, space becomes un as unimportant as time. And in a moment, the space between you and I becomes infinitely small. Our bodies entangle the distance intangible, moving, curving, undulating as one, and potential moves from the finite to the infinite. I fold my yesterdays into your tomorrows, and I dream of our future's past. And when I say forever, I mean infinity plus one. And I wanted to use that poem. It's, it's a love poem. It's a love poem for um, my partner. It's a love poem for um, quantum mechanics. It's, it's an idea within quantum mechanics called quantum entanglement that is what I think is one of the most romantic ideas um, and I just kind of wanted to set that as the mood for where I, my work is coming from. It's about love and it's about acceptance and it's about a weird queer space that I wanted to develop. Um, but first, before I start talking about quantum states and queer realities, um, I want to talk about um, a piece that kind of started this journey, no pun intended. Um, I was thinking about escapism. Um, 2017, this was the spring. Um, 
Trump just got elected and I just wanted to run away. And I wanted to, and I was trying to find ways to run away. And it was not really about where I was going. It was just about escaping. And I started thinking about ideas of searching for a home, um, searching for utopia for the future, and how these ideas are so prevalent in science fiction. So I thought about how I could create speculative spaces and science fiction spaces in which my body as a queer brown person can exist. Um, and so I created this space to start to hint at this idea of space travel and interdimensional travel and the space is dis destabilized the viewer and made it seem like they were moving even when they were standing still. Um, and I, I had a great time making this piece and I enjoyed the piece, but I, it didn't get to the heart of where I wanted to be with my work. It didn't have the space for acceptance and love. It was really about fear and I was running away from something that I was afraid was gonna happen and something that did happen, but um, it didn't have the heart that I wanted. And so at the time I was reading Caro Valley's Seven Brief Lessons on Physics and um, I would just read the quote, space is no longer something distinct from matter, but it is one of the material components of the world, an entity that undulates, flexes, and curves, and twists. Here Rivoli is talking about um, Einstein's discovery of the theory of relativity, and it's this idea that there's, the space is not something different from everything else. It's not emptiness. It's, it's the fabric that binds us all together. It's the space that we live in and on. And it's this combination of time and space that becomes one thing, that becomes this continuum um, that I was most interested in, and this kind of beautiful idea of this flexing, curving, undulating form that is created by space and time. Um, and that's kind of where I started, I moved in with my work. Um, I was, I found myself very interested in ideas um, in quantum mechanics and queerness and how they started to relate in my brain, how they started to sync up, how they started to become this thing that it was one thing and not the separate thing. Um, in quantum states and queer realities, um, I'm exploring the ideas of queer quantum mechanics, what it means to have a multifaceted, multidimensional existence. Um, I'm access accessing the inherent queerness of quantum mechanics, this strange place, unlike um, Newtonian physics, which is what we um, base all of our ideas of the universe, how the moon revolves around the sun, or how the moon, revol the moon revolves around the earth, how the earth revolves around the sun, and, and how, kind of how everything in the broader spectrum works. But within quantum mechanics, there are no fixed or resolute ideas. Everything's kind of strange and confusing and weird, but it's, it's also beautiful and it's this place of chaos that I was very interested in. And um, in this work, this piece was one of the first designs I did of this like ribbon form that I wanted to create this thing that undulated and flowed and was always moving and represented both space and time and how it could hold this in one image. And so I was accessing the idea of the Mobius strip and how it is a non-Euclidic um, form um, and it has the an unorientable form. So it's not a easy, easily, um, I'm t sorry, I lost myself. It's not easily, um, mapped with uh, standard mathematics. So it requires this kind of special f kind of mathematics. And so I wanted this thing that changed and moved and wasn't easily placed in space or time. Um, and so the first works that I wanna talk about is superposition of a queer existence. Um, I started thinking about this idea of superposition and what it is is it's a particle can exist in multiple states at once and only when it's fixed or only when it's observed does it become fixed. And so with this piece, I was, I hung these pieces side by side without any space between them um, to elicit the idea that these are the same form in different states. And it's to represent the fluidity of queerness and to talk about the multi-faceted and multi-dimensional existence that we, ki we kind of all exist in. Um, I wanted to start to think about um, think about intersectionality and how I could represent that um, physically. Um, and 
for this piece, it's like me being queer and brown, being Mexican and American. Um, this work explores the nuance of the existence that we are not just one thing, but many facets are within our personhood. Um, and then I started thinking about um, quantum entanglement. And again, like I said at the beginning, this kind of romantic idea of these particles that are entangled so deeply that in an instance they react to each other, no matter the distance between the, the two pieces. Um, and so I created this piece where these two prints are just touching and to elicit this idea of this instant reaction to each other. Um, and I just found myself drawn to this idea of quantum entanglement. Um, with this piece, I was using the concept of entanglement to talk about the distance between bodies and what being part of one another's lives is, would look like, would feel like in this kind of speculative space. That though there are moments where they are tangled and touching, there are also moments where they're a little separate and further apart, but they keep coming back together. And I saw these forms as these kind of beautiful moments of interaction between bodies and how it would look to be intrinsically linked with someone on the quantum level. Um, and this is, this is just a speculative space that I was creating. These forms also held this celebratory nature to them as well. They're, for me, beautiful space ribbons that just celebrate what it means to be queer, what it means to exist. I mean, it's not, this is, I don't want to create this space just to be accessed by queer individuals, but as a queer person, it became this thing that I really wanted to create to celebrate for myself and for people in my community. Um, and so these forms became this kind of, I want to just put these beautif beautiful love ribbons. As I've said recently that I kind of was into, and I said it jokingly, but I think it's true, um, knowing what I'm thinking about, knowing what I want to happen with the work. Um, and then I started thinking about ideas of perception and reorient reorientation and um, exploring these ideas, what it would mean to reorient the future, space and time, um, and utopia. Um, thinking about how, like other um, science fiction creators, writers, um, musicians, painters, drawers, everything, every kind of artist that creates science fiction, they're changing what it means, what the future looks like, or what we think the future looks like. Um, but to think about it as a brown person, if I am to be in a future utopia where everything's perfect, but I'm being marginalized now, how am I gonna have access to that space? Um, I started to think about how I could start to access that space myself, how, grab that space, take that space, own it. And so I started creating these forms and these spaces. I started thinking about first, how can I exist or how can we exist as kind of multi, uh, in multiplicities as, as this multiple thing as still thinking about intersectionality, but also thinking about light and matter and how we become these two different things and how that we start to change. Like this was at first was thinking about how I could change myself and so to become what I needed to do to fit in. And so that's where this piece came, started out as, and then it was like, I don't want to do that. I don't know why I'm thinking about that. And so this became more of like just owning the space that I am all of these things. I'm multiple, I'm in, I li exist in multiple spaces and I exist as a multiple, uh, a thing of multiples of um, different intersectional existences. Um, and then I started thinking about how I could start reorienting the idea of printmaking, of painting, of drawing, and changing the perception of um, how we view these kind of works and how we think about these kind of works and also thinking about how we um, view 4D, 2D, 3D, ideas and plus like thinking about the fifth and sixth dimension as well. And so I started making these digital um, animations and projecting them over prints to kind of elicit ideas of um, higher dimensional thinking. Um, here's a video of this piece. If I can find my arrow, which direction am I supposed to go? Oh, there we go. Um, and so within this piece, um, I wanted to, talk about this idea of, um, this performative idea of coming out, of continually coming out. This piece kind of goes in and out 
of focus and in and out of view. And it's, it became this idea of what it feels like to have to be comfortable enough with someone to be open about who you are and how you exist. And so this piece was, it has these like kind of awkward moments that I feel like kind of elicit some of the feelings of having to like kind of figure out when it's safe, when you feel comfortable with somebody, when you feel comfortable in a space to say that I am this, I am X, Y, Z. Um, and so it's just, this piece was all about this, like these different transitional spaces of existing. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of elicit some of those ideas and explore the, the nature of the surface of the print. So that it's a digital print with um, projected animation over it and it becomes this space where things don't, aren't settled. Things aren't like exactly what you think they are. And I really think that I, am try I wanted to try to push this like performative act as a visual, in visual form is an abstract piece. Um, yeah. And then I wanna talk about the piece that's currently here that's in the New Media Gallery, um, Reorienting Space and Time. And again, like I said earlier, I was thinking about how I can recontextualize the idea of space and time and the future. And I wanted to create this piece that transported the viewer, um, that made them question the orientation of what is physical, what is light, what is moving, what is still, and to kind of transform the space in a way that would be this portal to another dimension. Um, and here's a little bit, I mean, you should go look at it. You don't have to if you don't want to, oops. Um, but it's a different experience then, but here's a little section of it. And so it's a three, uh, it's a triptych of prints that have projection, been projection mapped and it changes the way the print exists, it changes the way the video exists and it becomes this other space but I other it for myself so that I can exist, so I can feel that I have this place to exist in and I'm claiming this space for my own body and for other bodies like mine. And also a, to be a space for everybody to exist in. Um, I don't wanna not include a person from this place. I want it to be a place where we're all open and accepted and honest and earnest. Um, so. I think I went really fast in my talk. I don't know how long I have, but yeah. like, now I gotta find my arrow. Sorry about that. Where the hell is it? Okay, and then finally, I wanna talk about this piece. Um, we are space time. Um, this is a really recent piece. I'm, st I'm still kind of working on it, working with it. Um, and so with this idea, I wanted to capture all of us, capture everybody, what it would it look like to map out all of our lives as we have moved through space and time? What was that trail we would leave behind? Where would there be moments where we intersect and collaborate, where we would dissect or move away from each other and verge into new spaces? And what does that look like if, if a four dimensional, fifth dimensional being is looking at our, our existence? mapped out all through time. They, see all, they might, be, might be able to see all of space and all of time at once. And so what would it look like for each of us to exist as paths of our own lives? And so it's chaotic, it's beautiful, it's weird, just like life. And so that's kind of what I wanted to create with this piece was this kind of chaotic, beautiful ribbon form that kind of just celebrated existence, it celebrated everybody and not just no one particular body, but this idea of what space and time would look mapped out as our movements through really around the world. I mean, we don't, we haven't traveled further than the moon. So, I mean, we don't know what exists out further if there's other bodies, but this I imagine would be what we could see a part of space and time and all of us moving through it at once. Um, and then finally, hopefully I didn't go too short. I feel like I went really short, but I don't know. Um, I'll close with um, this quote from Douglas Adams. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, All you really need to know for the moment is that the universe is a lot more complicated than we might think, even if you start from the position of thinking it's pretty damn complicated in the first place. <laughs> yeah. And there's my information. Um, thank you so, so, so much. Um, yeah, so hopefully you're ready, but yeah, thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Allison Smith and I'm chair of the art history department at JCCC and I am delighted today to introduce to you Bo Hubbard. I don't know if uh, any of you received this KC Studio magazine in the mail last spring, but I remember very clearly my reaction when I pulled it out of my mailbox and I saw Bo dressed all in blue with polka dot, blue polka dots on his face wearing ginormous blue fuzzy slippers. And I, before I even had gotten in the front door, I thought, wow, I'd like to know him. And so I'm delighted today that I have the opportunity to get to know Bo a little bit better. To give you a brief overview of Bo Hubbard's career to date, he is a graduate of the painting program at the Kansas City Art Institute, where he currently works as an admissions counselor. He received several fellowships, including the Leroy Neiman 15-week intensive studio program, and Bo is also the art director for Art and Loop Foundation and is a second year resident of the Charlotte Street Foundation. Bo is also the co-founder of Alter Art Space, a queer artist collective that provides multidisciplinary opportunities for local artists. Alter received a rocket grant from the Charlotte Street Foundation in 2017, as well as a Meow Wolf DIY award. Recently, Bo's studio practice involves creating rugs through the process of machine tufting, and this is the type of piece that we have in our collection downstairs on view, and I'm sure Bo will be focusing on that in his presentation in just a few moments. So I will turn it over to Bo. Please welcome Bo Hubbard. Hello, everyone. My name is Bo Hubbard. Um, thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, and thank you for coming to listen to us. Um, I am very excited to be part of this exhibition. It, I have my work hung in a gallery with people that I've studied in school, um, artists that I've look, looked up to for a while. So uh, it's a little bit surreal. I'm still trying to figure out how to process that a little bit. So I wanted to first start by talking about my work with Alter and then talking a little bit about my personal artwork. The reason why I want to start with Alter is so I don't have to throw in these pictures of me looking like a clown in between <laughs> the pictures of my artwork. So this is um, from that same uh, installation at the Nelson Museum that was on the front cover of the KC Studio Mag. Um, so this is me and my business partner, Boy Boy. We together started Alter Art Space in 2016 um, and opened our doors in 2017. And so here's another perspective of us at one of our events. Um, as Allison said, Alter was a dance party. It was a monthly installation focused dance party that um, we opened once a month with a different theme allowing people to come in and start to express themselves dress up in different ways um, have a space where they could participate in the nightlife um, in maybe a more spontaneous way so i have a video this is kind of our alter reel Thank you. 
So we ha had always planned to have 12 events, one a month for an entire year. Um, it's not possible to have one every month for the rest of my life. So we set an end date um, and we worked with the cycle from birth to death. So you saw us coming out of a couch at the beginning. That was kind of our birthing. Um, and. You also saw five of our events, so we had seven more after that, um, ending in our final event of death, um, which was a giant funeral. This is a photo from that event. Um, so now that that year is over, we and our kind of alter family and extended um, travel around to other um, parties, other scenes, participate in different opportunities, um, sometimes as party starters, sometimes for fundraisers, you know, being the clowns at the party to make people feel comfortable. And that was really what Alter was about for us is um, being the face of an event, you know, putting in the back work for the event of um, transforming a 4,000 square foot warehouse into something unexpected. You walk up, um, you travel to the West Bottoms, and you walk into what seems pretty unassuming, walk through the doors into a really completely new world. Um, and so we wanted to be those hosts, those, um, that kind of starting point for feeling comfortable participating in a space, feeling comfortable participating in a community. So moving on from Alter, I'm gonna show you some work um, that I made before while I was in school and then talk about the rug pieces. Um, so my past work has a combination of installation and object making. I was really interested in domestic spaces, recreating furniture and small objects. Um, and I always started with small objects and really starting to create my own materials out of found objects, which is a very nice artist way of saying trash. So, so working with trash, breaking it down into small pieces, manipulating it, recombining it in different ways, melting, and um, really, who knows, right? <laughs> it's like a mixture of many different things. And then uh, continuing to make objects until I, started having ideas for larger installations. And so I was working with immersive installations while I was in school, um, which kind of led to my work with Alter as well. But making these installations that um, a little bit post-apocalyptic, a little bit messy. Um, this installation was called Studio Apartment, so it was one room with, a, we have our kitchenette on the left and you know our little dining area. So starting to abstract these domestic spaces a little bit, but also starting to think about fantasy and how to 
um, exaggerate an emotion from a space, how to give a space a certain atmosphere. Um, and they did become pretty dreamlike, a little bit disorienting, but also wanting these spaces to be calm and meditative. So after I graduated school, I went on about six months of residencies, and one was an eight-week um, studio technician for a paper studio. So I have some experience in paper making and print making, um, but really running this paper studio, prepping all of the things, and also getting to make my own work in the process. So my work with paper is probably most in line with my work with rugs, which is um, what is in the exhibition. So both paper and rugs have a interesting way of being three-dimensional. I'm moving, moving paper around on a uh, wet and letting it dry into a flat form, or with the rugs working with three-dimensional yarn, manipulating it to create um, a fairly 2D image. So working in between 2D and 3D pretty fluidly. This was the first rug piece I made. Um, my friends that I met while I was on those residencies started a company where they started selling these tufting guns, and that's what really got me into it. They encouraged me to try it out, and I had a, a strange feeling that if I bought it, if I bought the machine, I would, I would uh, end up doing this for a while. So I was hesitant at first to committing to one material, um, but it has been re it's been really exciting, and some of the things that are really exciting for me about it is that one was that thing I mentioned about being able to work between 2D and 3D. Also, it allows me to isolate color. So all of my color is coming from yarn that I'm you know, thrifting or collecting or people send me in the mail at this point. Um, so I don't have to worry about mixing my colors and getting all messy and getting out of control, right? Everything's very controlled. Um, and it's also a slow process, which is important to my work. Having time to reflect and look at the decisions I'm making as I'm making them, um, how each decision relates to the next. And when I am working, I am pretty much focused on formal elements. That's really my pathway into making art, working with shape and color and line. Um, Texture kind of comes naturally with these, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But I am working abstractly, so shape and color really become my um, tools. They become my tools for developing content and figuring out how to share that content with people or the interpretation that other people are getting from these pieces. So it's like, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to say as an artist? Um, a lot of these have a strong reference to landscape. This one, you can really start to see that. Um, but with others, they are um, a little bit more abstracted. So other than landscape, the kind of broader term that I use to think about my work is um, an art term called biomorphic, which bios is the first part, bios meaning life and morphe meaning form. It was a term that was started around the 1930s to talk about some abstract art like Henry Matisse or Joan Miro, um, to talk about these shapes. Shapes that um, start to relate to living things, so plants, animals, or even humans. But all natural shapes. So Nature is very important to me in these kind of natural forms, so the opposite would be geometric, geometric forms. With the natural shapes, um, some of the, th the draw I have to them is um, just my experience with nature. If you, you know, going out and going on, going and seeing a beautiful landscape or um, watching a sunset even, you know. There is a beauty in that that is a lot uh, bigger than I am. It's uh, not trying to be beautiful, but it is. And that's a lot of the reason why it is for me, because it's not trying. It's not telling me 
that it is something that is supposed to be beautiful. So with the rugs, I am really trying to tap into that, trying to discover these elements along the way um, and seeing, you know, as I make a shape, is that giving me that sensation? Is it making me uh, curious? Am I um, interested? Do I see a reference to something that maybe I've known in the past? So some pieces like this have a little bit more direct references, um, working with flowers or plants, um, but starting to distort them and manipulate them in different ways until there starts to be new shapes that come out. Um, and so, again, asking, was I discovering this natural beauty? So putting these colors together and lines to, much like my installation work, start to give each piece their own atmosphere, their own ambience. And also making pieces that are calm and curious, like the others. So going into the piece that I made for the Nerman, this is not it. Um, this is, I don't have a photo of the piece downstairs. Um, this is the sketch that I made for that piece. Um, the piece, all of the works that I've shown you are about three by four feet. The piece downstairs is about five by seven. Um, so it's the biggest one that I've made so far. And once I took it off of the frame that I was making it on, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't put it back on the wall. That was like the job of the museum, thankfully. Because um, it is pretty heavy. So after I finished, uh, tufting it or getting all of the, the yarn in the backing. Then I went in and sculpted the surface. This is a sheep shear, um, literally used to shear sheep. So going in and using that machine and also working a lot with hand cutting to bring out some of these forms, um, to have the surface texture move in and out, much like the imagery inside of the rug. So the piece downstairs is titled Moonflower. Um, when I started this piece, I knew the only kind of prompt that I was starting with was that it was going to be another combination of all of these white yarns. Um, so thrifting white yarns and so really each spool becomes a different color at that point, um, which creates a lot of smaller shapes and a lot of, a little bit more intricacy and a little bit more pain to make, um, just because I'm not working with kind of store-bought yarn. But I knew all white wanted to be the starting point for this rug, so a lot of the time when I do have that initial starting point, I turn to the internet, um, Googling, white things, something really simple and basic like that, but reading through lists um, and until something interests me. So I have heard of this, this moonflower before um, from my grandma who actually is sitting in the back, which is exciting. <laughs> um, but it is a flower that um, opens at night and closes in the morning. Uh, this was very interesting to me. Uh, it also is known to be used as hallucinogens in the past. Um, and this idea relating to the show of thinking about my younger days as a teenager um, living in Oklahoma City, going out to our one street, 39th Street, um, and starting to participate in a queer nightlife um, and almost being a different person at nighttime. That has changed a little bit at this point, but reflecting a little bit on my past and thinking about what an all-white piece might look like. Um, is it idyllic or is it pure? Um, does it start to break down once you move closer into it and start to see the textures and the variations on the surface. So here is my contact information and I really, um, again, thank you all for listening to me.
We'd like to open it up now to questions to the artists, if you have any. If not, we have some prepared. This is from Matthew. I wonder why you use you both as a substrate on your screen prints. Um, Lava is to uh, kind of elicit those ideas of light because light, because it, trans, it's transparent lupo, or yupo, lupo, um, and it's to kind of allow the light to come through. So they become, started to hint at like animations and projections. So it was before I, I started using it to kind of make those decisions to make them look kind of like light before I decided to move into working with animation. I have a question for Bo. Um, I'm curious about your relationship um, like between the rug and the wall or that orientation from you know maybe anticipating something to be on the ground versus being on the wall and does that drive maybe a little bit of the uh, some of the shapes or like geometry or ideas that come from it because I kind of do look at the work and think about how it could go either way. I'm looking at an aerial space or I'm looking at a more like traditional landscape space. I just wanted to hear more thoughts about that transition from wall to open floor to wall. Yeah, um, so when I'm making them, I, I really do think a lot about um, macro or micro, kind of that aerial or microscopic viewpoint, and moving back and forth between those two while I'm making them. Um, the reason why I put it on the wall is because I do want it to be seen as a, um, as a window, as something that you're looking into in contrast to being more of a sculptural element um, in a gallery or a rug and a home. Um, so that there is a fine line between those two things, um, but I think putting it on the wall allows the viewer to be able to look at it as a painting or as um, a two-dimensional image. Um, I have a question actually for both artists. Um, I'm curious about your viewpoint on it. Have it written out because I have to quote something. Um, in his book, Cruising Utopia, The Then and There of Queer Futurity, Jose Esteban Munoz declared in his uh, first words of the text, um, queerness is not yet here. Queerness is an ide uh, ideality. Put another way, we are not yet queer. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as, a, as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. We have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that um, can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. So with that kind of in mind, um, my question for both of you would be, um, what do you, um, what hope do you have, uh, or what actions or potentials do you see being possible for um, the future of queer people? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I guess I could, I guess I could um, talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I know, I, I imagine that the, this like, I mean, my work is imagining a speculative space where queerness exists as itself, where people exist as themselves. And so I think that there might be a point when we move beyond the idea of queerness and it becomes something completely different. I think, I don't know that we've arrived at queerness or if we will arrive at queerness, but I don't know that we'll ever arrive at utopia, so it's hard for me to imagine. <laughs> um, but I do, I, do, I do try and imagine that we will arrive at a place where it is an open place of love, and that's kind of what my work is speculating. So I, don't, it's, I guess that's an answer. <laughs> <laughs> to quote RuPaul, everyone say love. <laughs> yes, everyone say love. <laughs> um, with this topic, I'm interested in kind of the undergroundness of queerness. Um, and that was kind of what we were focusing on with Alter is being able to go to this undisclosed location and um, show up and then find a community there waiting for you. Um, so I am, so with that being said, the otherness of it, um, you know, I definitely don't want to be an outcast. I don't want to be, um, persecuted or uh, even challenged on my orientation, but 
I do still find a lot of community in those spaces and in that mindset of um, having that separate outlet, having that um, having that uh, kind of weird and uncomfortable space um, where we're all unsure, but we're all being unsure together, right? So I, that really doesn't answer that large question, but yeah. I couldn't have answered that large question. <laughs> I think I think that idea of chance and like leaving things sort of open and being willing to just yeah embrace the unknown. I think that's I think it's so important to the future. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, I, so both of you create um, environments and experiences um, for the viewer, and uh, Matthew, yours is more utopian, and Bo, you've described yours as post-apocalyptic, <laughs> so, and I have a feeling maybe um, Bruce Hartman had that in mind when he paired you two up, I don't know. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, and Bo in particular, if you could explain um, how you see your work as post-apocalyptic, and also if you could comment a little bit on how Martha Stewart fits into that. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of those references are from kind of my installation work and um, working with trash and manipulating things, and Martha Stewart being the icon that she is, um, <laughs> as you know, a, a crafter, um, as someone that makes things um, from scratch. And so, whether it's with the trash or now with yarn, um, which is not made from scratch, uh, not made from wool. Um, but manipulating materials and staying somewhat true to that craft-based work. Um, craft-based work can have the potential at some points to um, be on the outskirts of fine art. And so I am interested in, again, that outskirts sort of attitude um, with the post-apocalyptic thing, I don't know if that comes in fully with the rugs as much. Um, creating a new world, um, creating a world that is from that place of scratch, um, I think comes in a little bit more working in fantasy. The reason why I've used that term post-apocalyptic is because um, my, the fantasies that I am creating, you know, and I say this with like my dreams too, I'm not imagining unicorns in my dreams, right? I am, it's still grounded in what we know as this reality. And so that kind of post-apocalyptic idea is creating a different reality with the supplies that are here, with our own reality. Um, I might be dreaming about unicorns, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think Bo's work is grounded in reality, and I think mine is grounded in this, like, I need a fantasy space to imagine in order to get by sometimes, so it's like the, it's still within the idea of escapism that I was playing with, um, but I think it's just imagining this kind of quantum realm where we can exist as pure potential. And so I think that the idea of, like the given idea of utopia of everybody working together and getting along and existing in this peaceful, everybody's rich, everybody's happy, everybody's, nobody's working, everybody's living in luxury is not real. But I think that for me, it's this imagined higher space, higher realm of existence. If it's like a spiritual space or a fantasy space or this um, scientific space that we could potentially exist in, I think that's what where the work is coming from. So a question for Bo. I was wondering how you translate your work with Alter Art Space, which seems so like fun and spontaneous, to then working with rugs, which is like a very methodical, laid out purpose. Are they like separate, or do you draw like different things from each of them? 
Um, well, Alter is fun and spontaneous for four hours while it's open. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, right? There, um, so I am a fairly serious person, um, aside from those, those four hours while it was open. Um, I don't really have a direct relationship between my individual studio practice and my um, kind of community-based art practice as well. So working with Alter and also um, continuing to work for the Art in the Loop Foundation, which is focused on promoting public art downtown. Um, so for me, it's, it's a lot of the time just two different outlets to um, express my creative creativity in different ways. Uh, for uh, you talked about the chaos on your ribbon work, and all I could think about was it was chaos when you have connected and then coming apart. How do you how, how do you get into that? How do you uh, make the forms that overlap and intertwine? And <coughs> like, are you asking me how I actually make the design and the? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, it's just like. Yeah, I, I just draw kind of something that feels comfortable for the things I'm thinking about. And it's a lot of just me spending time with the forms and remake. I make hundreds of little drawings and sketches and to make, thank you, to make the forms and decide where things intersect and where things are become flat and yeah. I'd be interested in knowing how you got so interested in physics. <laughs> and then I'd like to see your reading list. <laughs> um, it came from science fiction. I mean, it came from the reading different works in science fiction and wanting to know more about where the um, writers were coming from and where they got their ideas from. And then I found this like kind of love for these kind of romantic ideas within the science, within quantum mechanics and astrophysics. And, and I'll just listen to a lot of podcasts, read a lot of random stuff. And I was just doing it for fun. And then it just made its way into my work. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Matthew. Um, so I, I'm kind of interested in the kind of presentation that you gave where you, the work started seemingly pretty flat, talking about all kinds of other worlds and spaces and places that, that uh, just spaces that didn't really exist. But then as you, like the last few works that you showed, the work literally started coming off the wall. Mm -hmm. And even the installation, which I haven't seen yet, you talked about how you wanted everybody to be part of a space. So, so can you address that, that the notion of actually kind of taking a, 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 some, a place somewhere else and then kind of making it real? And conversely, I wanted to say something about it too. It feels like your work did the opposite in the presentation period, where you started in an immersive space, and then you kind of worked backward to kind of a flatter space. So, yeah, um, for me it was like I was making these 2D prints and drawings and they are pretty flat, but within them and I mean, you, it's harder to see and there's a lot of depth of space within the actual forms of the ribbon. So the patterns that are being made are I'm actually using images from space and kind of eliciting some of these um, spatial relationships between the flat and the distance and the like openness of space. So I, I started that way and but it wasn't it works for me. I don't know if it works for everybody in those spaces, but I wanted to push them further. And so that's why they, I felt like they had to move. And I feel like they're, I'm still pushing them further to move even into even more um, like uh, immersive spaces. And so um, I think even this isn't far, the piece here isn't far enough for me. And so I think that I'm gonna keep, keep going. <laughs> we'll, see where, we're, we'll see where I end up. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, when I was making those installations, um, I was in a place where I felt like I had to do everything all at once and express all of my ideas all at once, um, which is actually impossible, but it was very maximalist. And um, now I have a little bit more time to think about the more specifics about that, how going back to some of those formal elements of how certain 
properties um, trigger a certain reaction. Um, and limiting myself in that way with really just color and texture and shape. Different approach, always changing. So.